Um, Rachel, down the bottom of the screen are uh, two uh, arrows, left and right, and those are your mm -hmm. forward and back buttons. The floor is all yours. Welcome. Thank you. Apologies, everybody, for that. <laughs> I think I need a glass of wine before I start now. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about my PhD um, findings, which were about midwifery practice during birth. And the starting point for most research is practice, and that's why I decided to do that. I was very interested in what do midwives do and how is that experienced by women and how does that influence their experience. So I won't go heavily into methodology because I know it's of no interest to most people. Um, I used narrative inquiry, which was in-depth interviews, collecting birth stories. I had 10 mothers and 10 midwives, but both the mothers and midwives ended up telling me far more than just one birth story, as you can imagine. The analysis was thematic, and I applied a feminist approach to the research process, which was more in that I acknowledged power imbalances and the fact that I was a researcher and um, various other things throughout the research methodology, which I will not go into. Okay, so narrative inquiry. I chose that because women and midwives and mothers are very familiar with storytelling as a way of sharing knowledge. I did an analysis of narratives, which was I looked at the stories and found themes that occurred across the narratives rather than the other form, which is where you actually create a narrative as at the end of the research process. And I approached it with um, construction. The construction of meaning is actually created by the people who are telling the stories and listening to the stories, that there is not a truth to go and find, that we actually construct our truths. Um, after I'd found my findings, um, I then used the explanatory framework of rites of passage to explain what I'd found. Um, I didn't find that, um, in, I didn't set out to find that. I had all these findings and was doing a lot of reading around how can I make this all make sense and then came across an old article and it all fell into place around rites of passage. So Van Gennep and Turner um, are really kind of the, at the forefront of developing this theory around the stages of rites of passage and um, it is it's from anthropology really. However, they were men and they were very much looking as outsiders on small scale societies. So I was looking at women. So I was trying to apply a feminist lens and it was I was looking at um, something that I was part of as well. So it wasn't really from an outsider's perspective. So let's look at the different phases in the rite of passage. So this is any rite of passage. So from boy to man, from, I don't know, you can see it in society, in, in graduation, for example. There's lots of it, but it's often hidden in the society that it occurs in because it's normal for us. So the separation phase is where there's a um, separation of that person from their previous status. Um, and then they enter into the liminal phase, which is where they are neither this nor that. They are between states. Um, Turner referred to people undergoing a rite of passage as a neophyte and that they were often considered to be in another place. So often boys would be taken away from villages to, to, um, as a rite of passage to become men, in which in the liminal phase, they would be considered to be neither man nor boy. There would be um, rituals performed around that, which would reflect to them what was expected in their new status. Um, and in terms of labor, the physiological process of labor itself, that rhythmic, um, aspect and the pain that's inherent in birth um, naturally transports women into this almost altered state of consciousness. And then the incorporation phase, which is where the person going through the rite of passage um, takes on board the lessons learned through that rite of passage and this transformation and growth. So I don't want to, I haven't got a lot of time. So basically I'm looking at rituals cushion disturbance and there's often rituals enacted around rites of passage in times of danger or times of concern for humans um, and I've used the term ritual in my research as anything that is repetitively and routinely done for every woman in labor so this isn't the things that we do for a specific woman it's things that midwives were doing for every for every birth pretty much and I ended up conceptualizing midwifery practice as ritual companionship now that wasn't um, that 
Turner and Van Gennep talked about instructors and guides, which were like shaman or elders who would um, would take a person through a rite of passage, and that still happens throughout the world. But I didn't feel that midwives were really guides or instructors. They were more of a companion. So that's why I decided on the word companionship as opposed to instructor. Okay, so this is my, ent my entire thesis. I wish I could have just handed that in. So these are the major themes. And as you can see, there's some intersecting themes between women's experience and midwifery practice. And then there's a little bit of theme off to the side, which I shall explain. So the rites of passage. Oh, that's interesting. It's gone off to the side. Anyway, you twist your head and look at that. Um, these were the themes that came under the rite of passage. So for women, they experienced birth as a journey through aloneness was one of the themes and midwives met that by tending the boundaries of that aloneness. So an example is one of the mothers talked about being in the shower and um, to shut out the water. Um, the water could fill my ears so I couldn't hear. Everything was muffled and all I could hear was like this music in the background. I wanted everyone to be quiet. So that very much came through the women's stories that they were trying to shut out the external world. And the midwives were in their stories stories telling me about managing distractions and that was a big part of what they routinely did for women and I really encourage the people that are around her to try and keep talk to a minimum just encourage them not to ask her questions so that was happening during the separation phase when women needed to separate off and head into this labor land in the liminal phase women were in their own world um, but then once I went into proper labor, I did keep my eyes shut and I felt like I was in an animalistic kind of meditation, weird sort of feeling where I didn't really know what was going on around me and I didn't want to be disturbed. I was in like in another state, like in a state of mind I've never experienced, like a deep, strange meditation sort of thing. And that was all of the mothers, whether it was their first baby, second, this, there was an element of this happening in their labor experience. Now, these were all women who had had physiological births even if they hadn't had for other babies that experienced at least one physiological birth. Um, and midwives were saying that they would be with them during that. You know, I'm, I'm actually there with her in labor, but I'm not, they're connected. It's not just a job. And then in the incorporation phase, women reintegrated with the external world. So one woman was talking about the sun coming up and um, this new baby and the doors started opening in the house and they all came barreling into the bedroom and by 10 o'clock they were all on the bed in the bedroom the whole family chatting away so this was the woman reintegrating with the external world physically and with this new baby as a mother of this baby and then midwives assisted that um, in hospital for example Becky um, assisted that by trying not to rush mums and dads because you know that their time with their new baby is just so precious you know that you can't take back that time. And what hospital midwives were doing was they were um, kind of help assisting with that reintegration. So there was the integration of the, fa the, the family, the mother, the baby, and partner, and then into the postnatal ward, and then the larger family, and on. So the other themes that were running through the rites of passage were self-trust and inner wisdom, and nurturing self-trust and inner wisdom. And I'm going to skip a little bit through this so I can get to the rights of protection. Um, so during labor, um, in the separation, sorry, in the separation phase, this often happened prior to labor for women. They needed to build this self-trust in their ability to birth. And midwives met that by reflecting that. So telling the woman to trust herself, um, do what her body's telling her. Um, and then in the liminal phase, when women were in that altered state of consciousness, there was this real inner wisdom at work. So women were, were feeling what was happening within their body um, and just trusting that they could birth their babies. And again, the midwives reinforced that by saying, you know, trust yourself, listen to your body. All of the midwives were saying that regardless of setting. And there was midwives in mostly public hospital, um, private hospital and some home birth. And then in the incorporation phase, women felt this sense of empowerment as they um, incorporated their birth experience into the sense of self. So I love Emma's. Um, I had the most awesome birth. I felt like holding my baby abo above my head with a triumphant roar like a ro warrior when she was born. Unfortunately, the umbilical cord was too short. And again, the midwife was, was told me about women, a woman that she looked after who 
was on cloud nine for weeks afterwards. Um, so empowerment was part of every one of the women's stories that I talked to. So rights of protection. So that's the blue bit. The, um, these are the themes that didn't intersect with what women um, women's stories said. These were themes that were very much coming through in the midwifery stories and a little bit in the, in the women's. So in all rites of passage, um, there are rituals enacted to assist with a safe transition. And I call those rites of protection. And um, the function of rites of protection is to ensure safety, but they also transmit and reflect cultural values. So within our culture, in the Western culture of birth, they are the clinical assessments. So the listening to the baby, the vaginal examinations, those routine assessments and clinical monitoring um, that happen for every birth. And midwives talked about this within their um, stories. And what these rights of um, what these rights of protection did was contradict the rights of passage. So on the one hand you've got you've got disturbing the aloneness, you're trying to create this space where the woman's not being disturbed. One of the uh, mothers, Hillary, said, and the midwife annoyed me a bit because she tried to take my blood pressure when I was having a contraction, I would go, go away, go away. And amid, the midwives acknowledged that what they were doing was often quite disturbing for the woman. So Edith talking about um, blotting the baby's head to see where the baby's head was in the pelvis and calling it a necessary evil. Um, that it was something that you know you have to do, but aware that it was quite invasive. Um, and then they also undermined the in, inner experts. So on the one hand, we're saying to women, trust yourself, trust your body. But on the other hand, we're going, well, we'll just check that your body's working all right. Um, and Anna talked about her midwife who was digging around trying to make sure the baby was head down. And it, the baby had been head down all pre her pregnancy for months and months, and she knew her baby was head down. And Claire, another midwife, um, found it quite um, distracting when the midwife was listening into the baby um, because she knew the baby was all right which I think was an interesting finding for me because I wasn't, I thought the listening to the baby's heartbeat would be reassuring and that is not necessarily how women found it. Um, one of the big and more worrying themes that came through was redirecting the journey. So midwives told me about how after a clinical assessment by finding something, they redirected the woman's journey to one of intervention or something that it would not have been if they hadn't have done the assessment. So this um, Danica had done had listened into the baby's heartbeat when a woman was pushing and heard a deceleration, which we all know is normal. But because you have to then inform somebody and a senior midwife was in the room, they'd ended up escalating to the uh, obstetrician being coming in and actually doing a von Tuss birth for this baby. And the baby ended up with a tentorial tear and was transferred to another hospital. And this is Danica reflecting on that. And I know that that baby didn't need to be vacuumed out. I just know it didn't but we turned it into that scenario and the baby was vacuumed. I was really disappointed with that management. Like I just, I knew and I didn't know how to stop it. It was happening. I wasn't in control. So midwives were also assessing labor without disturbing it. So I didn't, uh, there was no questions in my, I just said, tell me your birth story and off, off midwives and women went and midwives jumped from story to story. Um, but they were telling me when they, was, when they were telling me about women and what was happening, they would say, and then I knew that you know, she was very close to birthing because she made, and then they'd do the noise. Um, and Julia here, and as an observer, I think you can see a performance really, it's going on in front of me. At this stage of this performance, what is it saying? And, and it's what she's displaying, the way she's moving, what her body is doing in a physiological sense. And Isla also saying she would rather be guided by the woman's behavior and the sounds that they make. So midwives, we're using other methods of assessing women's progress and well-being. So this is the kind of bit I wanted to get to, is why do midwives perform rights of protection? So why are we continually doing clinical assessments when maybe women find them disturbing and they contradict us telling women that to trust their body? So authoritative knowledge is the knowledge that, ca that basically counts. So Participants agree in a particular situation that, that they see as consensual on the basis of which they make decisions and provide justifications for a course of action. It is the knowledge within that community that is 
considered legitimate, consequential, official, worthy of discussion and appropriate for justifying particular actions and by people engaging in accomplishing the task at hand. And the power of authoritative knowledge is not that it is correct, but that it counts. It enables people to be accountable within their community of practice, so for midwives within the midwifery community of practice, it provides a set of practices and rationale that are accepted. Um, and the community sustains, produces and sustains its authoritative knowledge. And it's pervasive because it appears to be natural and reasonable and consensually constructed. And of course, probably no surprise um, to anybody practicing in the the kind of medicalized world. Um, the, we are working in a technocratic paradigm. So m most of our practice as midwives, um, if we just, I'm not going to read them all out, but body as a machine is a, is a key thing. If we reflect on what we're doing in terms of monitoring labors, um, authority and responsibility is inherent in the practitioner, not the patient. You know, it, it's our fault if things go wrong as the midwife, we get sued and a supervaluation of science and technology. Science and technology can save the world. Um, Davis Floyd states that as has been clear for over 20 years, most routine obstetric procedures have little or no scientific evidence to justify them. They are routinely performed, not because they make scientific sense, but because they make cultural sense. And McCourt argues that despite claims of evidence-based practice in mainstream maternity care, practices are underpinned by an established hierarchy of understanding and practice rather than by research. So regardless of assertions of research-based practice, which is the maternity care system will often have guidelines and argue that this is research-based, that's not authoritative knowledge. It's actually culturally-based practice because whether practice reflects research find findings is dependent on the culture. So here's some examples of supported by research, not supported by research. So if you have a look in the supported by research, we still haven't got a lot of that happening. Continuity of care, continuous support in labour. Not supported by research is happening a lot. CTGs, vaginal examinations, ARMs um, to augment labour. So Research-based guidelines, question mark. Um, when I get bored, I um, like to get hold of guidelines and try and find out the research that underpins the guideline. Um, and it takes a while because, for example, in this case, so you've got the fetal heart rate and the timings for the fetal heart rate and the reference 39. That takes us to British Columbia Perinatal Health Program, which don't have any research to support their statement around that timing and instead reference the um, the Canadian obstetrics and gynecology guidelines which have no research. So we have no research supporting how often we're doing fetal heart rate listening in. Um, and the same with the 89 which is a vaginal examinations. In fact we've got research that suggests that four hourly or now it's not evidence-based that routine vaginal examination should not be part of a normal labor. So we have guidelines that people are following that don't actually have any research to support them. So why do midwives do it? Um, this is what midwives told me, that they were tending the needs of the institution, um, that they were being watched and they were performing for an audience, which led me to rights of protection for whom. And they were coping with this. I've, I identified three ways that I felt they were coping with this. Um, and I'll expand a little bit more. So superficial conformity. This was where, this was often used by, and I'm linking this now in with the literature, um, by student midwives. So this is where you just do what you're told to do because that's safe for you. Um, and you know that it's not the right thing. So you do in the vagina examinations, you do in the clinical assessments because you're following hospital policy. So here Edith is saying it's protocol is to do them every four hours, whether they need it or not, um, according to the protocol. So, okay, you know, you follow the protocol. Covert authenticity. The midwife practices in a way that is true to her beliefs and knowledge, but does so um, not openly. So these, these are, this is very common. So this is the midwife who will do a vagina examination, but the woman's only nine centimeters when 
you know, cervix is actually completely open. Um, so midwives would be doing that to buy women to, oh, on, to buy women time. Covert authenticity. This was one of the strategies for covert authenticity was to place the responsibility with the mother. So for example, Andrea, who was offered a vaginal examination to a woman, the woman said no. So she now can say, you know, she's got the right to refuse. And if she wants to do that, I'll support her. And they've said, no, I don't want that. So I then go back to them, to the doctor and say, well, she's actually not consenting. She's actually refused. So therefore I cannot allow that to happen to her as her midwife. And I've documented that in the chart that she's declined. So that takes the pressure off the midwife because it's the woman who's declining. And then there's overt authenticity, which actually none of the midwives in my research practiced about, um, which is where the midwife does exactly what she believes in, which is aligned to her beliefs, which is impossible when you're working in a hospital with policies. And, and the midwife who had done that, um, the reason I've got a picture of Joan of Arc is because she said she felt like Joan of Arc and she's no longer a midwife. Um, Danica worked with a midwife um, who, sorry, I get distracted by <laughs> the text box. Um, Danica worked with a midwife who practiced in that way and she was, you know, she thought she was fantastic. She's wonderfully strong. She won't rupture membranes, you know, just because someone says to type of thing and she'd throw evidence back at, you know, the midwives who are in charge or, you know, the registrar. She, so she was impressed by that but was not prepared to do that herself. So recommendations for midwifery practice and education. Do we want to be on, which side of this do we want to be on? So I think this is my last slide. So valuing, this is what I came up with is what I'd like to see, is valuing with women midwifery in practice and education. So have, instead of mandatory workshops on emergencies and CTG, yes, do that, but we also need to reinforce the value of what midwives are already doing, tending the boundaries of aloneness, nurturing self-trust and inner wisdom, and really creating an environment by which women can have a physiological birth and need the interventions. Development of woman-centered knowledge and understanding of the birth experience. Let's actually look at research around how women experience birth. Um, holistic woman-centered methods of assessing and well-being. Um, and then I've just put here na navigating discord. And that's how do we support midwives who are working in environments where it's not safe for them to not follow policies. Um, and they're under a lot of pressure. And that's kind of, I see... a that last one is, is I really want to do something about that because that keeps coming up in my workshops in, and I'm kind of stuck with that as to where to go. So I might finish there and see if anyone can come up with how we can move forward with that. Rachel, yeah. thank you very much indeed for, um, for your presentation. Um, your last question there about navigating Discord, I sense that there's a, that question is coming up in the chat box on the side here policies versus doing what we think is the right thing. Um, do, you, uh, do you know where you might start with that question? You, you want to go and investigate it. What, what, how might you go to investigate that? Well, the problem is you're working with a, an oppressed group who's looking after an oppressed group. So you've got midwives who, I think actually, if I had to say one, one thing that might help to shift it is continuity of care. Because as a midwife, if you have, have you've developed a relationship with that woman, um, through pregnancy and then going to labor with her, whether that's hospital or wherever, you have more of an investment in supporting her and challenging policies with her than if this is a woman who you're going to see for 12 hours on your shift, you're never going to see her again, but you are going to see these people that you're working with in the hospital setting. Um, yeah, I, I, if, oh, yes, and out of hospital care. Yes, if, hosp if care, regardless of where a woman is birthing, is based outside a hospital. See, home birth, you've kind of got it anyway to some extent. You haven't got the policies. Um, and although home birth midwives have their own set of problems, and I'm, in, in, I'm a home birth midwife, so I get that, midwives in hospital are far more constrained on a day-to-day -day level in terms of how they interact with women. Uh, let me bring you to another question here about um, Denise's raised here. When does covert authenticity become negligence? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good... Wouldn't it be great if we could all just absolutely write the reality of what's happening? If there's a poor outcome, then that's when people will tra track back and say, was it substandard care? 
Now, when, when they're looking at standards of care, guess what comes out? Clinical guidelines. So we have midwives being judged by whether or not they followed a clinical guideline that has no research evidence to back it up. And I guess that's where, and I'm reading that in evidence that shows semi-supine woman does not want to get off her back. Well, you document that. And I think a lot of our job ends up being information sharing and writing down the information that we're sharing. Midwives and hospital view. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so Susie, they say midwives in hospital here in our area are really not allowed to be different. Where, whereabouts are you, Susie? Yeah, yeah, the US is. And that's the problem is midwives are almost becoming doctors. In our practice, in order to gain professional recognition, instead of saying, do you know what? We are actually the experts in physiological birth and the experts in supporting women in that. We're saying we can also do all these clinical assessments and we can also be like doctors. When actually we're, diff we're very different and we need to acknowledge that and value what we have as working alongside. We need obstetricians, but they're very different to midwives and why do we want to be like them? No. You're getting a lot of a uh, lot of comments down the side here, um, agreeing uh, with you. Um, questions, though. So, yeah, navigate. I don't know discord. About how we can get around this? How can we change that? Or is it? Or does it have to become from women? Do women have to demand better? And women are they're taking they're choosing to birth outside the system and then getting blamed for doing that? Who's worried about? Who are you worried about that? Oh, yeah. And we are seeing increasing intervention, not decreasing. I've been informed that, oh. Yeah, and that women don't know that their, their practitioners aren't following evidence-based practice because there's an assumption if there's a hospital policy saying that this is what needs to happen, that that is evidence-based, when that's not the case. And that's one of the reasons I've got my blog up and running is because I was getting so frustrated with these standard routine practices that were not evidence-based. Uh, people are no doubt going to ask where your blog is, uh, so uh, we might ask you to type that into that uh, chat window oh, shortly, Rachel. So that we have it. Midwife um, thinking. Yeah, you're reading this as fast as I am here. And if you can find my thesis if you really want to read all of this in more depth, or maybe just the, the odd chapter, um, you can download it from my um, blog site. And you should trust their care for it, yeah. Oh, thank you, Denise. <laughs> uh, Rachel, we've, we've got uh, just a couple more minutes before we need to close this one off. Um, just uh, for uh, just out of interest, do the your your findings here um, are they are they um, do they resonate with all cultures all around the world? Have you been able to explore that? Uh, the, I know um, Melissa Cheney has done some research in the U.S. and they linked in a lot with what she was finding. So I think they they probably do with anywhere where you've got a medicalized system. And you've got midwives attempting to provide woman-centered care within that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I can't really because the findings are really to some extent limited to the population or the, the sample that I had. I can't really then say, yep, that is the same everywhere. But it's the research that I looked at in discussing it in terms of midwifery practice. I think the UK, the US, and Australia are very similar. Mm -hmm. So um, we have we have um, an audience here from all around the world. So um, again, in the chat box here, uh, as we're closing this session off, would be uh, might be interesting for people to to um, reflect their 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 views on on how your findings uh, resonate in their in their own uh, places of work. Um, Rachel, I think we're going to have to pull this to a, a close now. Thank you very much for. Um, uh, managing to calmly step into the into the uh, in the place after the technology failed on you, um, you did a great job. Uh, we got through that, much appreciated. Uh, I just need to slide through a couple of ending slides here for uh, our um, for our uh, audience. 
Uh, I'm going to switch off the uh, recording here. Uh, if I can remember how to do that. Well, I'll come to that in just a short while. Um, audience, we'd be delighted, please, to have um, uh, a photograph of you uh, from where you might be sitting this very